We'll move on to the uh, the weekend's hurling action. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, talk and points and, and big games and everything else that uh, that happened here. And I suppose we'll start with the game in Ennis. Clear 118, Limerick 315. Um, huge win for, for Limerick. They were obviously nine points down going into the final quarter. They then, they then outscored Clare 3-6 to three points, which uh, was was absolutely incredible. Um, Aaron Glan obviously scoring two five, getting two uh, very decisive goals. Uh, arguably, square ball on on both of them, which could very well be uh, be debated. Um, and of course, Donegal Dahlin getting a big goal in and amongst it as well. So quite incredible. Like what a turnaround from from Limerick. They looked down and out for about fifty or sixty minutes. This genuinely looked like one of the worst Limerick performances I think I've seen in the John Coyley era. And then with a flick of a switch, they just start playing and they just completely blew Claire away. Like it was, it was incredible to watch really. Incredible more than anything. They had 50% shot accuracy and things I asked. They were a few points down and then a few goals changed the game. Like I think Claire were 116 to 13 points up when Derby Burns stepped up for that free. And it looked as if like he was going short and things like that. Out of nowhere, it ended up in the net. Then they rustled, then you're just like, what on earth is going on here? And then Donegal go Dahl, they get a point. Then Donegal go Dahl, like, turns the clear defender. And to be honest, like it was a good, good effort for Donegal go Dahl, like, in fairness. And the another goal to his collection, obviously, good score in the league. But Aver Quilligan has to do better there for the second goal. And then the third goal was, I, I actually, even before the Sunday game analysis for Donegal last night, I couldn't believe the amount of space that Garrett Hayfleet was afforded for um, for Limerick in that situation and he hit the post and obviously Aaron Canat puts it in. Do I think it's a square ball? Look, it's a tight one, isn't it? Um, Aaron Galan's on the edge. I, I, it's a tight one, it really is. I do think, though, that, like, um, the first goal, I think it went straight in uh, as far as I'm seeing. I think Dorbert Burns got that goal, so I think that should have stood. I think that was just a poor judgment from Aver Quilligan and Connor Clear in the full back line. It was just poor enough from um, a clear point of view. And uh, Clear looks so comfortable. Like, even when Tony Kelly came on, you're thinking, okay, Clear, they're rose, rosing up the crowd. No, they're going to go on and win this game against Limerick. But then, as you said, the flick of a switch and it all changes. And it's just. It was just bizarre more than anything um, that it happened. And then um, I think John Lee kind of would go back into to the drive or thinking, we won this game okay, but that wasn't a good enough performance to even get over the monster that um, that showing. And if Limerick were to lose this game, I think there would have been a lot of worry. There would have been a lot of talk in the media thinking that this, this five in a row, is it going to go to a capitulation? But all of a sudden, it's already turned now. And it's just... It was just a bizarre set of events more than anything. And uh, yeah, um, Claire, I, I will say about this, this about Claire, they performed some in some aspects of this game. Aidan McCarthy, the starber of a game, there were very good performances on the Claire team. But you couldn't say it ain't anything other than this hour. They bottled us. They absolutely bottled us. Like they should have won this game. Simple as. But the fact they lost this game, though, they're going to Parky Heave against Cork. I think they will win against Cork next week. But that's a pressure cooker situation for them, you know. And like mm. to go into that in losing a game that you were so far in front in, like it's just it just the tables have turned more than anything. And it's just it was just bizarre how things did um, turn in this game and um, that the defensive line were very poor in the last few minutes and they they just crumbled under pressure. As soon as the Burns goal rustled the net, it was almost like it was almost like clear pa- panicked more than anything. Like Limerick, you, you get a goal, they get a point later on. And then Donald Go Dahl gets a goal. In, if anything, the Donald Go Dahl goal as well. The, the gaps in defence were absolutely unbelievable. I think it was about three on two. The three yeah. defend, defenders for the two Limerick attackers, it was just kamikaze stuff in the back line. And I don't you know, like it, it was just a strange talk for Claire. It was really, really poor from them. Look, Limerick will go back to the drawing board. It wasn't the best performance for them, but. Claire would feel sick after that because they knew when their heart and soul they would they should have won that game. Yeah, like I mean, it, it, it was mental, really. Like, and you mentioned about Claire bottling it. Like, what, 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 why do you think they did bottle it though? Because like they were what eight, nine points up, they were cruising. You're bringing Tony Kelly on, who's arguably Claire's best hurler. Now I know obviously he's he's been injured. He didn't play in the league, um, very rusty and everything else. Maybe in hindsight, it wasn't the best time to introduce them but at the same time it did make perfect sense like you're nine points off 
you're bringing Tony Kelly on, you know, you're bound to get a lift. The crowd are all on their feet. And like, like, was it just that goal? Do you think from like, it looked like Land got a flick on it, but you're obviously saying German Burns, like it went the whole way in, but um, like, was it just that goal that completely let, let, let Claire's heads go or, or something? Because they were, they were in so much cruise control. Like it was kind of bizarre to see them just completely fold. Um, like the only other time, it kind of reminded me a little bit of when they played Kilkenny in that semi-final two years ago in the first half where like everything just completely imploded and like the game was gone. Do you know, they got absolutely hammered. This was a little bit different because they were in front in their own stadium. And yeah, it was just, it was mental to watch. Like It was almost like when Bourne struck that into the, into the back of the net, it was almost like Claire didn't know what to do afterwards. They didn't know how to hold the lead. And they do have some excellent players and they have performed well in the league and they did perform well. They've been the second best team to Limerick over the last few seasons. But it was almost like they just capitulated and it, it was a hard one to comprehend because it happened so fast. 3-1 inside what are five minutes or something yeah. like that. It was it was just kamikaze stuff more than anything. And it was just the defending more like for the first goal, the Dermot Burns goal, it was Conor Cleary and Avery Quilligan. I don't know what on earth happened there between the two of them. Like, it was a ball drop short. Surely Avery Quilligan puts up the hand, slitter in the hand, but it somehow ends up in the net. The second goal was, was like, it was bad quality for Nimber. It was Donald Goldalic initially, actually, when you look back at the clip, initially he struggled to pick up the ball first time. And he picked it, picked it up wrong second time as well. But Claire still allowed him the chance to pick it up. And then it was just a tame kind of an effort. And Ava Quilligan should have stopped it. It kind of went underneath him. It almost like when time stopped. And they, as soon as them sort of things go against you and things go wrong, it gets worse. And the Garrett Hagerty in space, I just, for a Monster Championship game, especially with, and, I, and don't know, get pain of this brilliantly on the Sunday game as well. I think there was two or three Claire players on one area of the pitch, and Garrett Hagerty was on the other, and it, the amount of space that Hagerty was given, it was just unbelievable more than anything, and then the ball hitting them off the post, and Clare could have the complaints and everything about the square ball, it's a 50-50 decision with the square ball, but I'd be questioning about the Hagerty space, how have Clare allowed him in that much space when there's three, two or three defenders, and, and as in, around, like in the semicircle of Hagerty, like it's just mm. unbelievable more than anything. And it's it was almost like the hate were gone at that stage and the game was gone then. And like it was just nothing Claire could do about it after that. And yeah, it was just it was just a strange game to comprehend more than anything. And then um, yeah, Claire would feel absolutely sick after that. And if the if the unthinkable happens and they manage to lose to Cork in the part next week. Like serious questions would be asked about Clare looking at this game in particular because they had the game won, they had it in the grasp, they were six points up, and they somehow let it slip. Yeah, quite re- quite remarkable, really. Like you could you couldn't believe like watching it just just all unfold like in in front of your eyes. Like and like Limerick's ability, in my opinion, and I was tweeting about this and everything else. Like their ability to just turn it on, like with with a flick of a switch, I, I think is what makes them arguably one of the greatest GA teams in my opinion we've ever seen because we know their skill levels we know that the talent of you know Keen Lynn, Sharon Glan, Garrod Hegarty, Coyle Hayes all these lads like they've, they've, they've talent in abundance all across the pitch from 1 to 15 one of the best managers in the game in John Coyley Paul Connerks obviously in the backroom team as well but it's just that mentality I think that often gets forgotten about and it's maybe I feel like we live in this world in sport now where and obviously you're a a stats man and everything else and um you know data and everything plays a huge part in in sports nowadays and as so it should with, with more and more information becoming available but at the same time the mentality aspect i think often gets forgotten about and like how many times have limerick been in this scenario over the last four or five years you think back to tipperary in the, the 2021 monster final what they're, they're 10 12 points down a half time they come roaring back to to win that game. Um, you think back to last season behind against Galway, come back to win, behind against Kilkenny, come back to win. And now in this game as well, like their ability to just turn it on is is quite remarkable, really. Like if if I didn't know any different, I'd nearly say it was pre planned because it, it it almost looked too good to be true. Believe me, I don't think it's pre planned with uh, John Coyley. 
I, I don't think it's like that. I just think he, he's just a brilliant manager and just gets these players ready for these sorts of situations because it was almost like Limerick were ready for this sort of situation to happen. For, for them to pounce on Clare's mistakes, whereas Clare weren't ready for that sort of situation to happen yesterday. And that's also, that is a mentality thing. Like, and, and that comes with experience at the top level and being up there for so many seasons. And there's no doubt Limerick have some excellent players. And there is stages in the game. Look at the all Ireland final last year against Kilkenny. They were five points down when Paddy Dean got that goal. And personally, I thought, that's it. That's curtains. Kilkenny have this one. But they find some somehow, some way to come back into the game. And I suppose that's what makes five in a row champions. That's what makes good champions. Obviously, they haven't won five in a row yet, but they will do so if they win it this season. But like, that's what separates the greatness from the good. This Limber team, like even when they perform terribly, they somehow put it over the fire. Like, look at the Tipperary game at Sipper Stadium last year. I, I, obviously, the game at Park Heave a few years ago during COVID. But the Seppet Stadium game last year, when Barry Nash got sent off, it was almost like the board kind of capitulated around Limerick and they, did, they had nothing to do about it and they were really, really poor. Things weren't going their way in in a way. They still stuck at it and they got the draw out of that game. And then against Cork, they beat them in the last game of the season despite Cork performing well. That's just mm. Limerick in the nutshell. They are just an incredible team. They're a team to be admired. And even if the likes of Garrod Hagerty, Keen Lynch are off the arm, look at Keen Lynch yesterday. And the lads mentioned it, um, um, Cusack and um, Tyrrell, to be to be fair, and they weren't ranting for, for change. They were bringing good analysis, to be fair. But what they, what, they actually, what they actually said about Keen Lynch, the first three quarters, he was out of it. He was anonymous at the 15th position. As soon as he moves back into his preferred position at centre forward, in and around the middle of the field, it's almost like it's effortless to them. And, he, yeah. and at the flip of the switch, he performs well after that. And that's what makes John Coyley such a good manager. That's what makes Limerick champions. And I wouldn't be shocked in the slightest if they go on and win the five in a row game because their temperament, more than any other county at this present moment in the country, is levels above the rest. Yeah, yeah, no, it absolutely is. And um, I suppose for Clare, like you do wonder how, how they will respond to this. We've seen teams in the past so for big defeats and and not being able to recover like Waterford kind of springs to mind obviously two two years ago when when they got off to a, a rocky start following on from from winning the league and everything else so you, you do wonder how um or sorry Clare will will respond obviously um following uh, the defeat but uh, speaking of Cork that is who they'll be playing next and and they obviously got beat by Waterford two twenty five to one twenty five coming into this game. Cork were big favourites, and obviously we were doing the, the preview show during the week, and I was saying that just when it, when I start hearing so many people uh, like predicting Cork to win by 9, 10, 12 points, and, and look, I, I still fancied Cork to win the game as well. Like I thought they'd win it by 3 or 4, but you always just felt like Davy Fitz's team talk, like it was already done. He, he, didn't, he didn't need to say that, and he just needed to say, listen to what everybody's saying about you. People are saying Waterford are done. People are saying Waterford are finished, and then they put in a, a top top performance like that, and um, all of a sudden, like they've kind of shook up the dynamic in a Munster Championship a little bit because you feel like whoever does lose in that core Clare team, core Clare game next week is potentially gone. They probably are, to be honest, Aaron, and uh, potentially if more so for Cork because they still have Limerick to play. So, like it's just. It was poor from a car point of view, but it's important to mention Waterford were absolutely brilliant and they showed up um, the doubters in fairness. And what I said to you on the pod, I wasn't as confident as many Corks. I said we were going along well in the league and I said mm. to them, but I also said we have to be wary of Waterford as well. They still have quality players. The question was the temperament and what they did yesterday was superb. The temperament and everything like that. From the first whistle, Jamie Barr gets that ball, cracks into the net. And what Davy Fitz did as well, which was so smart of him, and they should have done this last season, let the ball at the Desi Hutchinson. Do not play him around the middle of the field because he's just not good at that. Put him in the corner and he will provide excellent play for Waterford. And it proved that way. He got 10 points yesterday. You have the likes of him, like yeah, Jack Prendergast was catching every ball out of the sky. Kevin Manley performed well. Jamie Barron, as I mentioned, tied the Borka. 
crucial to have him back into the team. I wasn't expecting him to come back into there. Connor, Connor Prunty there as well performed excellent. The whole Watford team put in um, a lot of work into this game. And you could see the reaction from David Fitz at the end of this. And it, it was almost like a sense of relief went out of them to go on and win it. And it was just incredible scenes from a Watford point of view. And well done to them for going on and winning, winning it. 45 shots overall in the game as well. It proved their dominance more than anything over this car team. So fair play to Watford for going on and winning it. 60% shot accuracy was as well, which was really, really good. And um, yeah, they deserved the win, no doubt about it. As for Cork though, like, to be honest, the first half in particular was so, so poor. And it was almost like they, they kind of unexpected, they, un, they expected, they, un, they, they, more than, they, they kind of expected Watford to fold like they did in the league. And that's a dangerous game. Like, Darf Fitzgibbon was the only good performer in that first half. The rest of them were really, really poor in this game. Um, they didn't sit, sit a fire whatsoever. Alan Connolly kind of did the second half. They, he got that goal. And the car could point towards the referee and the decisions and stuff like that. And of the two decisions, look, the team can't have a red card. I think it was a red card. I'll be honest with you. I know I am a Cork fan. It's a second yellow. You can't go swinging around like that. It's dangerous. I, I just think it was a second yellow. As for the Kieran Joyce black card, I, I make no mistake about it. Cork should be accountable for their faults and everything like that. And Watford deserved to win. There's no complaints about it. I don't think it was a black card though, Aaron. I think Jack Prendergast let go of the ball. I don't think it's a both goals for opportunity because Jack Prendergast let go of the ball. Having said that though, how could you make it so easy for Jack Prendergast to catch the ball straight from a Watford puck out? Cork have to ask that question. So, like, there was a lot of things wrong with Cork. There was a lack of fight more than anything, especially in the first half. Like, the second half, actually, their shot accuracy was 89%. They performed well in the second half, to be fair to them, other than that uh, pen decision and things like that. And the Damien Cahill and Red Card, to be fair to Cork. And they performed well at spades. In the first half, though, they just looked unprepared for the challenge. And they expected Watford, as I said, to hold. And that is just dangerous going into a Munster Championship game. And it was almost like, and like I know Dan Casey, a good friend of yourself and myself, um, on Red FM and Sports Show, said up until this game that this would be an easy game and Watford would be last in Munster. We both obviously said Watford would be last in Munster as well, but we expected that Watford surely would have a kick in them. Like Watford are still a good team. Jamie Barrett there, Ty De Borca, they still have excellent players. There's no doubt about it. And you, they were the second best team in the country for a reason a few seasons ago. So Cork had to expect that. They just didn't. And they go into next week now needing a win against Clare. But even that can't be, couldn't be enough, might not be enough because they still have to play Limerick in the next few weeks. And we know that game is not going to be easy whatsoever. So Cork are in a, a sticky predicament now. And yeah, it's, they only have themselves to blame really for that first half showing. It was a non-show more than anything from a car point of view. But from a Watford point of view, excellent showing. They shut up the doters. They played Tipperary in two weeks now with a lot of confidence behind them. Yeah, like it was almost like as if Cork, like they just fell flat on their face in the opening 10 minutes. Like they were what, 1-5 to two points down um, like after eight or nine minutes. And um, as you said, like they just, um, complacency maybe. And, uh, and maybe they bought into what everyone was saying with the fact that Waterford are, are coming in looking so poor and, and everything else and it's going to be easy um, and, and Cork just didn't look prepared for it at all like the, the amount of chances they missed in the first half like I don't think I've ever seen Patrick Horgan hit that amount of wides in, in one half of Hurland I think he hit like 10 wides at one stage in the first half which was absolutely mental Um, Sean he says here when are the Cork Hurland team going to get their act together shocking their decline considering their their history at the top table yeah look i mean obviously he didn't get out of munster last year and i suppose like this year as well it's it's just not looking good at all and um you felt like pat ryan was making a lot of progress as cork manager and look if if things don't go to plan i don't think it's a case of changing it up you know may, may, maybe you do give him another year i'm not entirely sure but all of a sudden like that defeat is just i feel like it, it could really set cork back now yeah, and I think the most troubling thing from a car point of view is the players that they are using. And I say this, a lot of Cork fans um, laughed at me a few seasons ago for saying Hoggy shouldn't start. And I said he'd more, be more of an impact sub. 
a lot of Cork fans coincidentally know last night and this morning were saying Hoggy should be dropped now. Yeah, look, look, do you see my point now? I think we need to use more the younger players. And it's not just Hoggy, it's Conor Lehan, it's Seamus Hartney. I just think they looked flat yesterday. I honestly, especially in the first half. And I think Hoggy, to be fair to him, only hit three whites and two in the first half, which wasn't bad from Hoggy's point of view. He tried his best, no doubt about it. Conor Lehan, though, one shot, um, five shots, one taken. Like, that's not good enough. It really isn't. Seamus Harvey as well. I think uh, we had a few shots as well. Had uh, three shots, two taken, had one miss as well. There was two misses for Shane Barrett in the first half. Tommy O'Connor, Kieran Joyce missed a few as well. So it was the whole team, really. It was it was just a collective really, really poor. And what a question about Cork. Why isn't Ben Cunningham in the team? Ben Cunningham was a brilliant player for the Bars over the last few seasons. He's been a star in the under twenty in the under twenties and minors over the last few seasons. Shane Barrett needs to have a, a more leading role. Alan Connolly needs to have a more leading role in the team. Robbie O'Flynn needs to start. Brian Hayes needs to come into the team more as well. But there's a lot of players in this car team that you're thinking, why aren't they starting? And it's no surprise when you think about Connolly Hard, Seamus Hartney, and Patrick Corbin were part of that 2013 team. They reached the order of the final against Clare. It had, it, that's 11 years ago. Cork have to move on from that now. They need to produce more younger talent. And they can't let that under 20 talent from 2020, 2021 go to waste. It would be just like, it would be almost like you have the tools there to perform well in Munster Challenges, but you're just not using them. And it's just. It's frustrating more than anything, and they're sticking with the older players. And this was my point a few seasons ago, and a lot of Cork fans went at me for saying this. We need younger players to step up to the mark more, more now. Like 2020, 2021, they're three, four years ago now. These players are 23, 24 years of age. We have to start using them now. The, the, the time is now to start using them. If, if we don't use them now, then it might be too late. And I just fear with that, with Cork. And especially as well, the, the attitude just wasn't right in the first half. It was almost like they expected Watford to fold, as I mentioned there, and it didn't materialise. To be fair to them, in the second half, they plucked up and they performed better. But it was just too little too late. And I just feel there's things to improve on for Pat Ryan's team. And the worrying thing for Pat Ryan, I do think he's a good coach. And I do believe if it doesn't work under this guy, under uh, Pat Ryan, I don't think any manager could turn around this. Because he was the manager of that under-20 team. He was um, he was uh, brilliant around the Sarsfields club, leading into many county titles over the last few seasons as well. He was doing a lot of work in the Sarsfields club. So he is the right guy. I do firmly believe that Pat Ryan is the right guy to take this car team. I just think he needs to show more faith in the younger players in this team. And the, the older players, look, they can still provide a role. Put them on the bench. And then they can provide a role later on in the game. Look at what Limerick are doing with Graham Mulcahy, for example. He used to be a very good player down through the years. You're putting him on the bench. He can provide a role when he comes onto the pitch. Richie Hogan, the same for Kilkenny last season. And he performed a role coming onto the pitch. The Cork could learn a lot from them counties. And I just feel certain things have to have to be put in place for Cork to perform better in the next few seasons. And um, yeah, the time is ticking. The time bomb is ticking. If they don't do better against Clare next week, their season could already be over. Yeah, it definitely could be all right, especially with Limerick to, to follow in, in the game that comes after that. So yeah, massive, massive worries from a Cork perspective. Um, maybe lasting on this game, Waterford, um, like you mentioned previously, like two years ago, they were looking like one of the best teams in the in the country. It's obviously all fallen off a cliff since then. Can Waterford kick on now, and can they? You know, because I suppose Davy Fitz said, "Look, listen, in his post match interview, nothing's done yet. It's just a win. You know, it's just a win. It's just two points on the board." Um, but Waterford all of a sudden now will be fancying their chances of getting out of Munster and 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 maybe kicking on from there. You feel like this win now could can really kick start their season. Possibly so. I think the game against Tipperary would be vital now for them. Number one, the game's at home, as far as I know, anyway. Correct me if the comments if I'm, if I'm wrong there. And number two, Clare and Limerick seem to be the two best teams in the country. So realistically, you're not going to get much out of them. So I think if Watford beat Tipperary, I think they're into the all-earned stage. And anything can happen from them. 
Like the, the main thing for Watford was to get out of one stroke the last two seasons. We know the talent that is there. We know that David Fitz is a good coach. It's just about providing it on the pitch. And what actually impressed me about Watford more than anything, I watched this closely yesterday, the third quarter. And David Fitz talked about this in the league constantly and how, how they lost games and things like that. It was the effing third quarter. Watford um, didn't the low car to build the lead in that. They didn't the low car to get in front, which was a pleasing aspect for them. Even when things were starting to go wrong a small bit, I think Cork scored three points in a row off the bat. And things could have easily flipped for that Watford team, seeing what happened over the last few uh, weeks in the league in particular. But I think they stood up to the challenge really, really well. And they could take that in the next few weeks now. And they could take the positives into the next few weeks. Like they played Tipperary in two weeks' time. They'll have a rest next week. And all of a sudden, things will grow in the garden for them. I do think the Tipperary game in the next in two weeks' time is a crucial one for them. Again, it's at home in Walsh Park. The home crowd will be rousing up behind them. And again, they aren't Limerick or Clare. They're beatable Tipperary. So if Watford produce the same level of performance as they did yesterday and more, I do think Watford have potential to get out of this Munster Championship. But once you get out of Munster, the sky's the limit, really. It absolutely is, yeah. Looking at the Leinster Championship, Wexford 121, Dublin 218. Uh, two dramatic late goals there for Dublin. Keno Sullivan and Danny Sutcliffe both getting the, the two goals right at the death there for, for Dublin. On a day where Wexford were very much in control, um, it was looking very much like it was going to be a Wexford win. Lee Chin scoring 112, Rory O'Connor with four points. Um, but Dublin kept themselves within touch and distance. Donald Burke with, with seven points in total. And then the two late goals right at the death to salvage a draw. Look, in the end, it's like it's a strange one, really. I still feel like Dublin probably actually needed to win this game um, because Wexford probably are more likely to get something from Kilkenny or Galway than Dublin are. But in the end, considering where Dublin were at, five points down in injury time, you know, to come away with the draw is is good for Dublin. And considering Wexford were big favourites in Wexford Park, um, good bit of resilience shown here for, for Dublin after what was a, a difficult league. To be fair, and um, and looking at the last few minutes, like Danny Sutcliffe and Keane O'Sullivan getting the late goals, like that was a big draw for Dublin considering the context behind it. But even going in before uh, throwing, you would have said the draw actually would have suited Wexford more. But it's almost like Wexford are kicking themselves. And even looking at um, and know the score, it's a very good website for looking at uh, head-to-head uh, games and the engaged games. Check it out if you haven't already. It's a new, very good website, actually. I checked the records between Wexford and Dublin since the round robins were introduced in 2018, and Wexford have only won one out of five games. That's a worrying yeah. staff for Wexford. It is, to be fair. Uh, Dublin won two, and there's been two draws in this. So, like Wexford, more than anything, would be concerned, number one, that they let the lead slip in such dramatic circumstances, and number two, that the record against Dublin is so, so poor. And obviously, Wexford had the potential... No offence to Dublin now, but I think Wexford have the more potential under Keith Russell to push on further ahead of the likes of Kilkenny and Galway into Leinster Championships and into the all Ireland series as well. They nearly beat Clare two seasons ago as well, which shouldn't be forgotten. So I do think Wexford under Keith Rossiter seem to be making a, a slight turn into, into, into a good season. But um, that result might set them back a few pegs now yesterday, so that was a difficult one to take for them. But... Uh, but I'd still expect Wexford to get out of the roof, especially in third place. Like they're more capable of getting results against Galway and Kilkenny. And added on to that, they're more capable of hammering uh, Carlo and Antrim than Dublin are. So um so it's it's a tough one to comprehend like who would be happy more with the draw. But Dublin could still turn it around, but they'd have to hammer the likes of Antrim and Carlo if they have any chance of getting out of the group now. Yeah, the big one is the next two games. Like Dublin are playing Carlo and Antrim uh, in their next two games, and Wexford will play Galway in in one of those two games. I think I think Wexford are playing Antrim next week. So, yeah, look, it's it's absolutely huge for Dublin to to win those games and put up big scores. I think that has been the worry. Like Antrim have come quite close in in recent years to actually beating us. They've uh, Dublin only beat Antrim by a point um, in in the league, as an example. So, um, yeah, that would be the concern. And I know Jackie Tyrrell was saying that you know Wexford go to Kilkenny on the final day. It just I, I can nearly see it happening already. Like both Dublin and Wexford will be going in on score difference. Dublin might have the advantage, and then Wexford will just do what they do and beat Kilkenny out of nowhere when Kilkenny are already secured in the 
in the Leinster final. You can you can just see it happening. But um, yeah, all in all, as a Dublin fan, happy enough with the with the draw. We'll we'll wait and see what uh, what obviously happens and what becomes of it after that. Other two games in Leinster: Kilkenny five thirty, Antrim thirteen points, thirty two point win there for Kilkenny. Uh, Galway Carlo was a little bit closer. It was Galway two twenty five. Carlo 214. Um, yeah, like it's it's one of them things. It, it, I suppose I don't really know what you do, really. Like, I mean, fair play to Carlo. Like, they did give a good cut of Galway and a half time. There was actually only three or four points in it, in fairness. But, um, yeah, like a 32 point win for Kilkenny against Antrim. Um, and like a lot of their big players all went off injured as well, like Owen Cody, Adrian Mullen, Owen Murphy. But, yeah, like what, what were your thoughts on both of these two games? I suppose expected wins, really, for both of them. Uh, for a Kilkenny Antrim game, nothing much needs to be said other than concern for Owen Cody and a uh, good performance from Owen Wall coming onto the pitch and getting 2 2 from O'Loughlin Gales, the Kilkenny champion. So, a good sign there, but that was a non event to be honest. Kilkenny strolled the victory in that. Galway Carlo, actually, when you look at the context of the game, in on 51 minutes, Carlo were four points down. Marty Cavanagh got a goal, and it looked like Carlo could easily uh, cause the shock of the championship. Look at that result, but then Connor Cooney gets a goal down the other end. Of, that's that. But to be fair, Carlo did themselves proud in Pierce Stadium yesterday. They only lost by 11 points. They were in the game in some facets of it. John Nolan had a good performance. Chris Nolan did as well. Martin Kavanagh struck a few points over the bar as well. So, um, but then again, Galway had Evan Nyland and Connor Whelan both on the bench. They actually came onto the bench. So, so like um, Galway, they have a lot to improve on despite um, players coming back at the team for Kenny next week. But for Carlo, that will give them confidence going into the games against Antrim and Dublin, especially in the next few weeks, that they can produce in the Leinster Championship. And they, they produced a very good performance, to be fair to them, against Galway. But, um, but yeah, the shock wasn't to be in Pierce Stadium. But as for the game in Nolan Park, nothing much needs to be said, really. Absolutely, yeah. Look, and, and certainly Carlo will take a, a good bit of confidence from it that they can they can stay in the Leinster Championship. Like I suppose score difference is going to be hugely important, and um, Carlo playing Dublin next up as well. So maybe they might uh, fancy their chances of causing a, a bit of an upset there. Looking at the games from the Joe McDonough, the big one here was uh, Leash beating Offaly two twenty one to twenty four points. Um, big result there for Leash. Paddy Purcell with two one. Uh, on the day, obviously, a couple of late goals to, to turn it around. So, yeah, Leash carrying on their momentum from uh, obviously winning Division 2A. So, they're they're in good steads to make a good push at the John McDonough. They are. And uh, even though, on a side note about Clover, I think this was excellent. Clover actually showed this game and they're showing all three John McDonough good games next week. So, what hmm. would we do without that service? It's brilliant. And fair play to the guys at Clover, a huge shout out to them. And even look at the clip in uh, this awfully leash game um, in the last few minutes. I think uh, one of the clubber commentators actually said on, on Twitter uh, earlier today, it did go under the radar, but awfully missed the last minute point to make it 25 points to 121. Dane Leash take a puck out. Paddy Purcell gets it down the other end and strikes it in the back of the net. Jubilation in the uh, O'More Park. Brilliant win for Leash. Um, huge win. And Paddy Purcell, excellent performance from him. To be fair, Adam Screeny, what a performance from him coming on for Offaly, scoring eight points. So that deserves a mention as well. But to be fair, Offaly play against Westmead next week. And both those sides, we get on to Westmead's result in the sick, which was a surprise in itself. But um, yeah. Westmead, are playing, Westmead are playing Offaly next week. And that's a huge game. Huge game now. And um, the loser of that is a huge danger of not uh, making promotion to the Joe McDonough Cup. But big result for Leash, huge wins against, um, against uh, a, D, a very good Offaly side. And that would give them confidence to potentially go for a promotion push there for Leash. Absolutely, yeah. And you, you mentioned the, the, the other game. Uh, well, the, well, speaking of this, first of all, down 324 Mead, 25 points. So big win for, for down there. But West Mead getting beat by Kerry, 114 to... 120. Um, not many people seen this coming at all. Obviously, Westmead playing in Division One all year, very much seen as one of the the big favourites. Um, they were my pick to, to win the John McDonough. Um, I don't know if they were your pick, but they're certainly most people's pick anyway. To at the very minimum get to a final. Um, and, and Kerry on the other hand side, we were thinking could maybe go the other way and and be there thereabouts in a in a battle for relegation, but. Yeah, what a what a huge win for Kerry Hurlan. Uh, Morris O'Connor there with one ten uh, in total. So fair play to him. But yeah, huge win for Kerry. Massive. And when you consider Shane Conway's missing from the Kerry team, Mikey Boyle retired in the offseason. 
to lose them through stalwarts for for Kerry Hurling and going on to win this game is massive. And I'm absolutely delighted for to go on and win this game. Unexpected. I did not expect them to see, beat Westmead. But fair play to the boys of the kingdom. And Morris O'Connor, as you mentioned there, one ten. What a performance. And um, Westmead, Joe Fortune's men now, back foot. They play against Offaly next week. Loser of that. Is is now on the back foot. Like awfully, they were my picks personally to go up to the Joe um, from the Joe McDonough. So one of our predictions are going to be wrong next week, Aaron. So it's mm. massive to think that. And um, so, so yeah, it's going to be a big weekend next week. But as for Kerry, it's a massive result for them because when you consider the players that they did miss, when you consider um, Shane Conway stepped away, Fiona you know, McKessie talked about being um, potentially being in the footballers as well, which wasn't great talk from the Kerry point of view. There was a few Kerry fans saying Stephen Lumphy should have um, left his post at the end of last season as well. I was hearing anyway. Um, and for him even to get a bit of confidence booster and winning against Westmead is massive. And as for Down, look, that was probably the most expected win out of the three of them. Um, Mead had probably struggled in the league. Um, Saoirse Bolfin left as manager. And um, there's been probably a few problems behind the scenes. Uh, Doc Sands got 2-2 in this game for Down, so good performance from him. But um, Down, good result for Roland Sheehan side. And uh, the, could Down provide a good a few results as well? I think they play Kerry next week. I'll have to double check. I think they play Kerry actually next week. So... That's a big game. Two sides that uh, are off the back of wins. The winner of that will fancy their chances of going up. Absolutely, yeah. I'll, I'll run through some uh, results here just from the, the lower tier. So on the Christie ring, it was London, 426. Sligo, 12 points. Derry, 226. Tyrone, 13 points. Kildare, 327. Wicklow, 14 points. And in the Nicky record, it was Loud, 17 points. Armagh, 18 it was Monaghan 116, Roscommon 417. Donegal beat Mayo 21 points to 14. And then in the Laurie Mar, Warwickshire beat Longford 221 to 216. Fermanagh beat Cavan 512 to 318. Or actually, that game was a draw, actually, to be fair. And uh, Lancashire were beaten by Leitrim. It was 120 to 225. So, yeah, in terms of uh, player of the week and moment of the week from both football and hurling, what are you thinking? I, I, I'll give my awards there in a sec, but um, just on those games, a uh, good performance from Jack Goulding, scoring 213 for London, uh, former Kerry player as well, so good weekend for Kerry Hurling overall. Uh, Kildare had a good performance as well, and they look to be on a serious trick. And just on a side note as well, why aren't these games being shown on the Sunday game? Yeah. It's, it's just it's just comical at this stage. Look, um, we can go on and on about this, and I'm sure that video is going to be out with me, you and Seamus. So tune in for that uh, tomorrow. And um, just a shameless plug there. And um, for player of the week in football, I'd probably go. You know what, Daniel O'Malley. What a performance from him and Killarney. I'm going to go for him. Excellent performance in um, shackling David Clifford in hurling player of the week. I'm going to go for Jamie Barron. Excellent performance for Watford. Can't really complain. Midfield. What a performance from him. Um, in, and then for moment of the week in in football. It's a shame Sligo didn't win that game, isn't it? Because that would have been yeah. slam dunk of the week. Um, I'd have to go for Johnny Gall beating Derry. Jim out, out tactic and um, Mickey Hart. That's a brilliant moment of the week. And as for hurling, I suppose Watt for Davy Fitz falling to his knees. That would have been my moment of the week. So, um, yeah, they'd be my awards for this week. Yeah, I think for a player of the week in football, I go Roy McHugh. He was, he was obviously outstanding for... For Donegal, um, and 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 coincidentally, like we were mentioning that game in 2014, he was man of the match against Dublin in that game as well, and he was it was outstanding in this game. So kind of incredible to to think, but um, yeah. So we'll go with him as uh, player of the week in hurling. I probably agree. I probably would go Jamie Barron um, as well. It's a hard one, really, because like you look at it, like for Limerick, were so poor for so long, so it's very very hard to actually give it to a Limerick player. Like Keen Lynch was outstanding for the final 15 20 minutes. But you know, like he, for for the fifty minutes, he wasn't really like. And Aidan McCarthy was outstanding. McClare obviously still ended up getting beat. So yeah, probably would go with Jamie Barron as well. And then moments of the week, um, probably would go with um, yeah, Davy Fitz obviously, um, the the celebration and everything else. You saw how much it, it meant to him in fairness. And yeah, just seeing the the, the Donny Gall Derry game sort of just be so similar to to the game ten years ago, like in, in terms of scores. In terms of um, stats and everything, it was just it was quite bizarre to 
to see it but uh but there we go so yeah we'll go ahead and wrap this up here anyone who's tuned in hit the like button and subscribe uh, if you could check out the gaelic statsman podcast that would be great as well and um yeah we'll catch you all soon <laughs>